Okay. <clears throat> uh, with that, uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome to uh, this year's Cal OER meeting 2024. It's a pleasure uh, to see you uh, so early in the morning on a uh, beautiful Sunday, although Saturday, Wednesday, uh, that's out there. So uh, the theme of uh, uh, this conference meeting is responsive pedagogy, extending local innovation to advance global impact. Uh, this is the fourth annual meeting uh, of the Cal OER. Before getting into uh, the details, I uh, wanted to recognize the organizing committee. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we have individuals from all four of the intersegmental uh uh, post-secondary systems uh, represented on the advisory uh, or on the organizing committee, uh, including uh, Nicole Carpenter from the University of California, Irvine, Leslie Kennedy from California State University Affordable Learning Solutions, myself, Delmar Larson uh, from the University of California, Davis, uh, and also Libretext, Cynthia Orozco uh, from Long Beach uh, City College, Michelle Pilati from the Academic Senate for the California Community College, Open Educational Resources Initiative, uh, Gabriel Rice from Cal State University Affordable Learning Solutions, Selena Silvia Ortega from uh, the Academic Senate for the California Community College's Open Educational Resource Initiative, and Shelley Wynance from California State University Fullerton. <clears throat> um, want to recognize the sponsors that were responsible for uh, this meeting, including the Open Educational Resources Initiative from the Academic Senate from the California Community Colleges, the Mickelson Foundation, uh, the California State University, uh, Affordable Learning Solutions specifically, uh, and LibreText. Uh, want to especially thank you uh, for the attending. Uh, your registration fee and contributions are critical uh, in making this event possible uh, and enable Cal OER is also able to provide live captioning. Uh, we are pleased to provide live captioning for this event through our partnership with uh, AI Media. All sessions will have a live captionist available and users may simply enable closed captioning by toggling on the caption within the platform. <clears throat> We have several hashtags. Uh, if you uh, would like to share what you're learning in this meeting on social media, including at Cal dash or underscore OER, um, Cal OER 2024. Uh, and this is the website that we uh, are using uh, for our primary promo. So let's go over a few basics. Uh, please make sure to mute yourself uh, when you come into the respective rooms, uh, if you are not muted automatically. Uh, we encourage the use of the chat, uh, which is on the side. Uh, the hosts for the conferences uh, for the rooms uh, will be actively participating and paying attention to the chat. If there's time for question and answers, uh, please raise your hand and unmute uh, when called upon. All sessions will be recorded and will be available on the Zoom events platform for six months after the event. You'll be notified when the recordings are live. All general sessions, the keynotes and systems updates will be available on the Cal OER YouTube channel for everyone. Um, and the link is right there, the tiny URL, which is tinyurl.com slash Cal OER archive. <clears throat> uh, with that, I uh, wanted to mention the two uh, keynote speakers that we have. Uh, we'll be introducing Cable Green uh, momentarily, uh, who is going to be giving his presentation on response, uh, giving his pre presentation on shifting to community owned and operated open knowledge. Tomorrow's keynote speaker, uh, which will be at 9 30 uh, a.m will be Dr. Virginia Clinton Lasselt from uh, University of North Dakota. Uh, and her topic will be on how Creative Commons licensing can promote equity and innovation. Um, with that, I thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry, a few more uh, additional slides here. Uh, we will be uh, presenting uh, tomorrow uh, the system updates for all three of the post-secondary systems uh, at one o'clock p.m. The three speakers that we have for that uh, is Dana Brechter Cook uh, from uh, UC San Diego for the University of California system. Uh, she's a representative of the Common Knowledge Group uh, on OER. Uh, Leslie Kennedy will be representing the Cal State University system. Uh, she's from the Affordable Learning Solutions Infrastructure. Uh, and Rebecca Ryan O'Shaughnessy will be representing the Chancellor's Office from the California Community College System. I encourage everyone to participate or to attend because it's going to be quite exciting. So with that, uh, the 
introductory slides are there. Uh, Cable, feel free to take uh, the, the slide deck as I pull up uh, uh, my introductory notes for you. I'm getting a thing that Zoom has quit unexpectedly. I do not know if other people. I think it's working for me. Can somebody give me a heads oh. up? Yeah, okay, but you're, you're good. Yeah. Okay, good. Maybe I'll wait for Delmar to come back. Yeah, I'm sorry. It probably just happened on my side. Um, so with that, <clears throat> it's a pleasure uh, to introduce Cable Green, the Director of Open Knowledge at Creative Commons, as this year's introductory. Cable holds a PhD in technology from Ohio State University. Uh, one second here. Um, Okay, hopefully I was muted. Okay, uh, Cable holds a PhD in education psychology from Ohio State University and works with open education, science, and research communities to leverage open licensing, content, practices, and policies to expand equitable access and contributions to open knowledge. Cable's efforts focus on identifying complex problems where open knowledge is a critical part of the solution and then opening that knowledge to help solve those problems. He is also a leading advocate for open licensing and procurement policies that ensure publicly funded education, science, and research resources are freely available and openly available to the public. <clears throat> the title of Cable's talk is Shifting to Community-Owned and Operating Open Knowledge. I look forward to his presentations and take it away, Cable. Thank you, Delmar. Uh, can you hear me okay? It's all cool. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Longtime fan of all the amazing open education work that happens in California. Uh, California has been a, a leader in this space uh, as long as I've been in the field. So, And I know that that doesn't happen without all of you. Uh, the pioneers are, are here in the room. So uh, I, first thing I want to say is thank you. <laughs> I've learned a lot from you over the years. Uh, let me go ahead and jump in. Um, I will say all these slides, of course, are, uh, unless otherwise noted, are licensed uh, CC BY, and uh, Delmar has a link to them, and we'll share that link with all of you after uh, after the slide show and after we uh, talk, and then feel free to reuse and remix them as, as are useful to you. Uh, let me start out with kind of some foundational principles that will help the rest of this make sense. Um, as uh, as our team that works on open knowledge uh, at Creative Commons, as we think about our next projects or where we should spend resources, uh, we have a set of uh, key principles that guide our work. Uh, the first is that publicly funded knowledge um, should be openly licensed by default. Uh, in broad strokes, what we mean by that is that the content should be either in the public domain or preferably uh, uh, with a license that allows for um, for revision. So kind of anything but our ND licenses, we tend to go with CC BY where we can. Um, uh, CC zero on data. So we work uh, to be clear with the world that data is in the worldwide public domain and zero embargo period. So uh, the moment that <coughs> a work is published, that was funded with public money, it should be available to the public immediately upon publication. Uh, so open license by default, get the data in the public domain, no embargo period. Uh, the second is that uh, publicly funds allocated to produce open knowledge should be spent as efficiently and effectively and with the highest impact as possible to maximize the public good. So we put this idea of public good uh, right at the center and that uh, kind of pushes us and policymakers to ask questions like, are we spending the money as wisely as we could? Are we using all the tools at our disposal? Uh, if we do this openly, can we do it better than if it's in a closed manner? Uh, and we tend to obviously come down this, on the side of open wherever possible. Uh, third, publicly funded knowledge should be stewarded by public institutions and, and or the academy and or nonprofits um, it, because that's where it should sit. Uh, kind of the opposite of that, as you might guess, is that uh, too often the knowledge that is funded with public money 
ends up in the hands of commercial entities. This happens with uh, drug research and drug patents. It happens a lot with educational resources. It certainly happens with uh, with research and scientific literature. And so when we uh, keep principles, when we spend public money, uh, that we should uh, put, put this stuff, host this stuff with public institutions or trusted nonprofits. Uh, fourth, equity should be at the core of any open knowledge model, policy, repository. Uh, we should be talking about equity, social justice, um, uh, equal access, et cetera, et cetera. The, the rights to uh, both use and remix, but also the rights to contribute should be at the center of anything that we're doing. Uh, next, commercial organizations should be treated by public. Let me back up one step. From time to time, we do need commercial organizations. They provide services that maybe we can't provide or don't want to provide uh, and can be a good partner uh, and or an asset in what we're trying to accomplish. However, uh, we, the public, we, the academy, we, nonprofit institutions, uh, wherever possible, should treat commercial organizations as work for hire in the same way that you might hire a consultant to build something for you or provide a service. Um, rather than us paying them to build something and then let them keep the copyright or us paying an entity to build a new service for us and letting them own the service exclusively where we can't own what we paid for. Um, we get ourselves in bad fixes when we do that. So when we do need commercial services, the public should run competitive procurement processes to secure the best services for the best price, and we should own what we buy. And then lastly, uh, to the copyright to publicly funded knowledge should be held by authors. You, you've probably heard of authors' rights or uh, professors' rights or educators' rights uh, and or the public institution that funded the knowledge. Uh, the copyright to publicly funded knowledge should not be transferred to commercial publishers or other interests. Um, this seems pretty obvious, but uh, increasing, it's, it, it's been the case for 50, 60 years that we take public money, uh, we give that public money to public institutions, uh, the educators, the faculty, the instructional designers, librarians, and others create stuff. And then in many cases, there's a technology transfer office that transfers it out uh, and we sell it off to commercial interests. So uh, we are big proponents of authors' rights and ensuring that if you build something that you're uh, generous enough to make open and contribute to the commons, that you should keep your ownership of that thing. You should keep the copyright or other related IP rights. Okay, so those are just kind of a few grounding principles. Um, the, the talk today is kind of broken up in these four categories. Um, the opportunity we have in front of us, uh, the challenges that we face, uh, we've got a bunch of changing landscape going on. Uh, we live in kind of a wild world right now. Uh, and then, you know, what are some of the actions that we can take uh, as actors in this space? Uh, so first, in the last 20 years, uh, this is not news to you, but just to remind us, I find this uh, useful as we're thinking about what to do next. We've got this toolkit uh, in our back pocket, all of us do, um, that is amazing if you think about it in terms of uh, what we've had as humans uh, throughout our history. Uh, and the three main tools uh, or four main tools are that uh, we're what we build, what we share in almost everything we do now is digital. Um, that's certainly the case for educational resources and data and uh, research and uh, increasingly art and other things. Of course, we still paint art as well, but there's a lot of digital art. Uh, we have the internet where we can move this digital things around the world at near speeds of light, and we can uh, do all this in a space of in, uh, decreasing costs. So we, uh, all of you own uh, it, not just one, but multiple computing devices uh, because the cost of these devices and the cost of uh, getting access to the internet has fallen so drastically. Now, of course, there's still digital divide issues that are very serious that need to be addressed. And there's some amazing nonprofits that are working in that space. Uh, and costs have fallen significantly. Uh, and then the last component of this chair is open licensing. So we, uh, we have this tool of open licensing. Uh, and if you add all these things together, we can legally share copyrighted works at the marginal cost of zero. And so for 20 years, we've been asking ourselves in education and science and data in software and other spaces, hardware, uh, if we can do that, should we do that? Do we have a moral and ethical obligation to do that? 
uh, you know, what, why, why do we teach? Why did I get an education? It wasn't to become rich. If I wanted to do that, I would have gone into investment banking. I got an education because I believe in it. I believe it changes people's lives. I believe that uh, it lets people do new things and fulfill their human potential and their dreams in ways that not getting an education makes it more difficult to do. Uh, and so these tools also have uh, other uh, really interesting side effects. Uh, you can get much better uh, ROI uh, efficiency for public dollars spent. Uh, we can reduce the friction of, uh, of reusing other people's works and of sharing. Uh, we can increase innovation. So for example, the entire human genome project was de dedicated to the public domain. That spawned a whole generation of medical science and drug discovery that never could have happened if the human genome would have been kept proprietary, for example. Uh, so in short, you know, where we come down is that open tends to be the better way, the more effective way to do all these things, educational research, data, science, software, hardware, policy, et cetera. Of course, open is not the same as free. Open is different than free. We say it's better than free because open is free, plus the legal permissions to do stuff with the content, the data, uh, other assets. Uh, Creative Commons of course, was not the first player to this open licensing game. Uh, open source software licenses uh, have been around much longer than uh, CCs existed for the past 20 years. Uh, and so uh, when people want to openly license software, we send them over to OSI and to other entities that do that work. Um, at Creative Commons, we work in the copyright space. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we're a nonprofit. We are the uh, Creative Commons open licenses steward. So. Uh, we take it upon ourselves to defend the licenses in court around the world, to update them, to educate about them, to answer questions about them, to get involved in uh, occasional disputes about them, et cetera. Uh, we, are, uh, we were founded in uh, 2001, so we're over 20 years old. We operate in every country in the world, uh, and we've got what we call country chapters around the world, including in the United States. Uh, CC licenses are in the public domain. A lot of people don't know that. So if the organization Creative Commons went away tomorrow, all the licenses uh, are, are actually in the public domain. We dedicated them using our CC0 public domain dedication. Um, and so they are they are free and they're free to use forever, uh, forever and ever. Um, we just had our 20th anniversary. Uh, so we're, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we are have become over these 20 plus years the international standard for open copyright licenses. So it's just kind of what people use around the world. Um, this is not an alternative to copyright. You keep your copyright and you add a license to your works. This is built on top of and respects copyright. So we operate quite heavily in WIPO, uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, and other entities that uh, that work in the copyright space. Uh, CC licenses are robust uh, in, in all the times they've gone to court over the past 20 years, they've never once lost in court. Um, and we have a lot of partners that we work with. We don't uh, work alone in the commons. We work with uh, lots of partners, some of, some of whom are, are here, including Libertex and, uh, and California's uh, great work with the legislature and in the Senate, faculty senate and community colleges, et cetera. Uh, our vision, uh, you know, why do we do this? We uh, we are working on a world where knowledge and uh, culture are open, where they're equitably shared in ways that serve the public interest. And so you'll hear this kind of public interest theme throughout the entire talk. Um, I won't talk about the licenses here. I think you all know that we've got six uh, open copyright licenses and we've got public domain tools. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to our website uh, or take our CC certificate. Uh, there's lots of ways to learn about the licenses. Um, the licenses are uh, perpetual. They last forever. They're irrevocable. They can't be taken back. These are kind of key features to ensuring that what we're all creating are public goods or digital public goods. Uh, we proudly say we put the open and open access research and OER and open data. CC licenses are, are just used all around the world. And you'll hear me use the, the phrase open knowledge um, uh, throughout. When I say open knowledge, this is what I mean. Uh, OER and practices, I'm talking about open access research, data, open science, uh, the open communities in this uh, open knowledge space, and then all of the open policies uh, that we work on to support all of these various uh, activities and communities. We talked a little bit about uh, the key principles at the beginning. Uh, when we talk about open educational resources, 
what we mean is you've got no cost access, so you don't have to pay money to get access to it. There's no paywall. Um, that, that it's uh, typically CC license. It doesn't have to be a CC license, but it has to be an open license that allows for adaptation. So even some of our licenses, like our ND licenses, are not OER compliant, if you will, because they don't allow for adaptations. And as educators, we change stuff. We translate a work. We modify it. It's not quite what we want for our students. And so we uh, maybe we add to it or take from it or change it in some way. And that's core to the idea of OER. Uh, or, of course, OER can be in the public domain as well. Uh, in any medium and format, so there's sort of no restriction on format and no embargo, period. So uh, something's not OER if it's locked up for the next 12 months. You've got to have access, no cost access to it. Um, same thing for open access research. I work a lot in this space as well. Um, no cost access, CC BY, they're a little bit more specific on licensing. They tend to sort of default the CC BY in articles, CC zero on data, and no embargo, period. So, so what's this public good that we're talking about and why, why will it affect who builds and who owns and where we should host all this stuff? Um, and I always sort of come back to these key questions. Uh, why do we teach other people? Why do we do science? Why do we publish research? Why do we engage in these academic activities that we've all dedicated our careers to? Uh, and I fundamentally believe that knowledge is a public good. Um, education is a public good, science is a public good, uh, and that open sharing of public goods advances universal access to knowledge and culture in furtherance of fundamental human rights. And if you look at the Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, uh, Article 26 is very clear, everybody has the right to an education. And so when you think about digital internet, open licensing, um, and using those tools, um, I am a firm believer and I am not ashamed at all to say, I think I do think as educators, we have a moral and ethical obligation to use those tools to ensure that everybody's got access to affordable access to educational opportunities, including the content, uh, the OER that we use in classrooms. I mentioned that we just had our 20th anniversary. Uh, so there was a lot of, you know, uh, birthday cakes, yay, looking back. Um, and that's fun, but what we're more interested in is what should we be doing next? What should we uh, do in the next 20 years? Um, and so one question that we're asking is, well, maybe we should uh, work where we can have the most impact. And so one question we asked is, uh, what are the biggest challenges in the world that need to be worked on? And many of you are probably familiar with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, these are 17 goals that are tightly linked with each other and interdependent. Um, that are using uh, UN's words, a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. And so when you look at the 17 SDGs, number 17 is we should all work together to do the others. So there's really 16, if you will. Uh, these are uh, agreed upon by the UN General Assembly, i.e. all of the countries in the world, that these are challenges that we all have and we need to work on collectively to solve. So you'll see climate action in here, uh, green energy, uh, reducing uh, inequalities, gender uh, equality, poverty, hunger, education is number four. Uh, all countries have challenges in these spaces. And so as we looked at that, we said, boy, if we're gonna solve or be part of solving some of those uh, sustainable development goals, the knowledge about them and the culture about them must be open. So the knowledge about them, that kind of makes sense, right? You know, the educational resources need to be open about climate change so that students can learn about climate change and university uh, students and college students can learn about it and maybe make their careers about it. The data about climate change needs to be open so we can do better research. Uh, but what about the culture? Well, if you look at all of these uh, problems, I would call them or challenges uh, to put a nicer spin on them, uh, these are human made challenges uh, and so it, and they're going to require human solutions and if we don't understand the culture uh, the, and of our societies that are creating these challenges the culture of the peoples that are involved in creating these challenges and the culture that's going to be uh, needed uh, and the understandings that will be needed uh, within humans to create solutions for these uh, then just sharing the knowledge isn't enough. So uh, at Creative Commons, we have a whole open knowledge program uh, and an open culture program as well. Zeroing back in a little bit into uh, open education, because this is a, 
Open Education Conference, um, uh, OER can be the educational resources that teach the public about sustainable de development goals. Uh, the SDGs are constantly changing. Of course, OER is modifiable. It's got an open license on it. We can update OER about the SDGs in real time. Um, this is the last two are sort of my particular love because I'm an education psychologist by training. Um, we know that learners learn best when they're in uh, authentic learning spaces uh, that matter to them personally. And so uh, learners who are working on SDGs can actually work on complex, authentic problems uh, that they care about, i.e., you know, the world's problems while they're learning. So, for example, we've got a, a kid in high school and the wall of his biology classroom is the SDGs. And when the biology teacher gives assignments, they have to pick an SDG that's the context as they're learning about that particular uh, biological concept. Uh, and describe it and describe solutions to it in the context of the SDG. And it's it's uh, much more exciting and engaging to at least at least our son. I'm assuming other students as well. Uh, learners want to make a difference in the world. We see the, you know, the some of the most powerful climate activists, for example, are young people because they have, yeah, they're gonna be living in this world. Climate change matters a lot. Uh, and uh, learning about and working on and affecting SDGs is meaningful work as they're learning. And so I think this is a really rich space uh, for us to think about when it comes to education and OER. Um, this is just one uh, interesting report. The uh, UNESCO and the UN put out lots of reports. Uh, but this is one that caught my attention recently where youth are demanding quality climate change education. Uh, over half of all the schools in the world have literally no curriculum about climate change, mostly because they can't afford it. So like, why don't we have climate change OER that would be free and people could translate it, adjust it for local context, uh, build their own, et cetera. Uh, because 70% of young people, this comes from this particular report, uh, say that they can't explain climate change. They only understand it broadly. They don't know anything about it. But uh, also once they do learn about it, um, they want to be engaged. They want to take action. Uh, another quick uh, different lens on this uh, is looking at uh, of all of the research around climate change, uh, only half of it roughly is open. Uh, and by the way, most of it is publicly funded. So why are we publicly funding climate research when we need to solve climate change and half of it we're allowing to go into commercial spaces where <laughs> the public can't access what the public paid for? Uh, and so to scientists that don't have the money to uh, either subscribe to these journals or uh, also as bad, they don't have the money to pay the article processing fees uh, to submit to the journals, it looks like this. There's this big paywall and they can't communicate, they can't learn, they can't share in ways that they should. And this is a problem because sharing knowledge is a social justice issue. Um, I know many of you are from community colleges. I used to work with community colleges in Washington. And I can tell you, and I'm sure you know, especially the librarians in the room, uh, that community colleges uh, do not have unlimited budgets. Universities also do not have unlimited budgets. And oftentimes we can't subscribe to all the journals and other knowledge that we need access to, and we have to choose. And it just seems wrong to me that publicly funded work should be locked up and not accessible to us, the public that paid for them. Uh, one of the projects that we have around this space is called the Open Climate Campaign. Um, this is about opening up primarily the research and the research data around climate. We also have a project called Open Climate Data, which is about uh, opening up the largest climate data sets uh, around climate change. So think like weather data, uh, ocean level data, uh, the rate at which Greenland ice sheets are melting, like big, massive satellite data sets. Um, that are a little bit different than research data, which tend to be about the article or the research area. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, interesting stuff. There's opportunity there. I would say there's a strong call to action that if we wanna solve those SDGs, all of them, we had better have open knowledge about them and open uh, culture about them. Uh, there are challenges though. We've got headwinds in front of us uh, and commercial interests which make money on things being closed are fighting back. And so in the education space, oftentimes you'll hear about uh, inclusive or equitable access. This is uh, not super new, it's a few years old, uh, but uh, the Department of Education, so this is just the US example, 
uh, gave permission to uh, actually bundle the cost of textbooks and other um, other uh, required educational resources into the cost of tuition. Uh, so it's kind of hidden. Students don't see it. Yes, it's a tuition bump, but hey, tuition goes up all the time. All my textbooks are free now. It's great. Uh, well, they're not free. You're just paying for them in a different way. They got bundled in. Um, this is a real threat to OER because, of course, once the uh, costs of textbooks and other materials are bundled into tuition and the faculty have now access to a catalog to just assign and the students don't have to pay more for those resources, the, you know, at least the affordability question of OER gets called into question. Uh, should I use OER? Uh, many faculty are still saying yes because they like the open license part of it. They want to be able to modify the work the way that they want to do so with their students, where oftentimes they can't with commercial uh, resources. They also want to keep a copy forever. They want their students to be able to keep a copy forever. Uh, and oftentimes with, of course, commercial licensing, you lose access when you're no longer a student at the institution, just to list one of the downsides. Uh, in the research space, uh, uh, we used to charge a lot for subscriptions and that got switched over to article processing charges. So commercial entities, journals used to charge to read and now they charge to write, which is just as inequitable and unsocially just uh, as not being able to read, but now only wealthy can write and publish research. And so it's just another barrier that's been put up. Uh, we've had huge wins, uh, again, sticking with the US because that's the audience here. Um, where uh, a couple of years ago in August, the White House announced that they were going to improve their uh, their public research policy. So when the U.S. government funds research to be done, they dropped the embargo period. They used to allow a 12-month embargo. Uh, agencies are now encouraging reuse rights, i.e. open licensing. Um, they uh, have better data sharing policies, et cetera. Uh, and when this came out, now the agencies are writing updated uh, open access plans and uh, licensing uh, and funding requirements that require open into their uh, their uh, policies. So if you take an NIH grant or an NSF grant or a Department of Education grant, for example, to do research, these new uh, policies are kicking in. Uh, and the publishers, commercial publishers' response to that was to uh, put language into an appropriations bill. Uh, which is now that got defeated, but now they're trying to bring this language back in through other bills, and this is still an active fight. Uh, that basically says what you see at the bottom of the screen here that uh, none of the funds made available by the government can be used by the government agencies to implement this open access requirement. So their you know their 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 financial models are threatened by the public having access to what the public paid for which we all understand, but frankly, not our problem, right? Our problem is to make sure that when we spend public money, that there's public access to those works and that new models of sharing and hosting will emerge around that. Uh, changing landscape. So things are changing in all kinds of ways. Things are changing politically. Things are changing technologically. We've got artificial intelligence on the scene. Uh, and with all these come uh, different opportunities. Uh, so first, I want to call out uh, that, you know, as I said before, we don't work solo. We work in collaboration with uh, with uh, other uh, organizations in the commons, with institutions of education around the world, with museums, with UN organizations, with other international governmental organizations, national governments, you name it. If they want to uh, improve the commons. If they want to uh, do more open, we're happy to work with anybody. Um, one of the entity we work, or one entity we work with a lot is UNESCO. Uh, so we help to write and are now helping to implement and educate about uh, the UNESCO recommendation on OER. If you haven't seen this, you should take a look. It's quite good. Uh, and we also did this uh, with the UNESCO recommendation on open science, which was adopted uh, last year. Uh, sorry, a few years ago, three years ago. The why do I bring this up? Because international frameworks uh, provide all of us some kind of political cover, if you will. Um, it's nice to be able to say at our institutions, to our deans, to our vice presidents or provosts, um, hey, the open education work I'm doing is really important. The UN says it's important. Here is the 
uh, framework that came out of the United Nations that says open education should be a priority for national governments. That's why we're doing what we're doing. And here's everything they recommend. And good news, we're implementing a lot of these things at our college or university. Uh, so we, we certainly find that useful in our work, and I expect you will as well. The other real benefit here is that working with national government scales impact. So good news, uh, the United States has rejoined UNESCO, and uh, our hope is that the U.S. will start to uh, embrace this uh, even more than they already have at the Department of Education and other departments that work in the education space, NSF and others. Uh, so how might we share knowledge in the most effective, efficient, equitable, and socially just, just way? Um, so I've been talking about some of the problems and challenges and fights, but if we could just design this from scratch, what would we do? So they're actually doing this right now in the uh, in the research space. Um, I talked about how at first we uh, we used to pay for reading research. Now we pay for writing research. And the open access community has essentially said, enough. We're not going to play this game anymore. Um, we need to move away from these broken models. And we need to create something new. And the thing they're calling it right now is diamond open access. Um, it's a bit of a problematic name because, of course, uh, there you've got blood diamonds. Diamonds are associated with colonialism, and so it's not ideal. Um, uh, and but forget the word diamond for a minute. Really, what this is about is this last sentence: community-driven and academically led and owned open access journals. And so it's this idea that we the public space, we the nonprofit space, we the academy need to take back, it's a bit of a Marxist argument, take back the means of production, take that back the means of stewardship, take back the means of ownership of our core discipline, which is knowledge. Uh, it's what we do in the academy. We do research, we teach about knowledge, we guide people through learning about knowledge. Uh, and I, you know, I just want to flag this is directly in line with uh, our core principles at Creative Commons. So some of the aspects of, and, and I'm sharing this story not because I want you to like join Diamond Open Access Movement, but it's this, it's the story is about how do we sort of take back control uh, and create what we need. So in Diamond Open Access, they, uh, they said, look, we're not going to charge fees to read or to write. It, we're going to design it to be equitable in nature. Uh, the people that really pioneered this were uh, mostly the Latin Americans. So there's over 29,000 journals uh, that are diamond in design. Um, it, but it's more than just no cost to publish or to read. It's also about this ownership. So that the not just the content, but the whole infrastructure, the whole stack that's needed of services and technology to actually run a journal and to submit to journals and do peer review and all the things that we need for, uh, for research are owned and operated by the community. Uh, and that includes the services that we need. Uh, sometimes, again, we might need commercial entities, but when we need them, we're going to pay them for their services. They will be work for hire. We're not going to turn over ownership of the content. We're not going to turn over ownership of services or any related systems that we're paying for. Um, right now, of course, commercial publishers largely own and control most of uh, academic research. This problem is this creates an oligopoly where they can set prices and conditions for how that market works. Uh, for example, right now, the commercial research entities are going to national governments around the world and saying, hey, the next generation of science is going to be text and data mining. And really, you know, when you do cancer research, you're not going to read seven articles about it. You're going to read 100,000 articles about it, which humans can't do, but computers can. And good news, you can do all your text and data mining with us, the publishers, because we have the authoritative copies. So they're trying to carve out sort of future innovative next-gen science spaces uh, for themselves with publicly funded content and data. And we need to stand up to that and say, no, that's not okay. We're going to actually build and own this ourselves, uh, which is happening in Diamond Open Access. And so, uh, you know, last bullet point here, this is about taking back control. It's about taking back control of the content through rights retention, and it's about taking back control of the, the hosting, the repositories, uh, and the services that are based around this. Um, this is just a slide to say, this is not just a pipe dream, this is happening. 
Um, the European Union is behind this. Uh, the EC Council got very into this. Um, the, uh, the entire country of France is putting in uh, millions and millions of, uh, of euros into this, uh, and other countries are lining up around diamond. And so just to sum it up, um, you know, people say, oh, this is like, this is, this is terrible. It's not going to cost all this new money. Where's this new money going to come from? And the answer is, we don't need new money to do diamond open access. We need to take the, uh, the you know, the large amounts of money that we're already spending and just repoint it toward a more sensible system that's open knowledge for research. And so we say there is a sustainability model for diamond open access or for OER or what have you. It's to fund research as a public good. It's to fund uh, OER as a public good. This is not easy, right? To change knowledge sharing models is difficult, but it is critical if we want to solve the SDGs, if we want to have equitable models of both contributing to and sharing and reusing knowledge where everybody can participate and not just the wealthy. Um, we need to ensure that publicly funded knowledge is a public good that we all have access to, that we can all contribute to, that we can all share. And so, you know, I don't have a great answer to this yet, but I'm watching the diamond open access movement with great interest uh, because my career started in open education. And I want to know what how could we do this in education? What might diamond open education look like? Um, and yeah, I think we can take some cues out of what they're doing with diamond open access. So how would we ensure that publicly funded educational resources are open by default? Well, we, can, we know how to do that. We can do that in policy with open license requirements. How do we make sure there's sustained publicly funded open education infrastructure and support services for all educators? Well, you know, we've got some inklings of that. We've got uh, LibreTex is here. Uh, Department of Education in the past has given them large grants, uh, but they've been, uh, so that's great and we thank them for it, but they've been episodic one-time grants. We, we need those to be sustained funding. We need the Department of Education in the United States or other entities to say, here's public money to run public infrastructure around open education in perpetuity, like as long as you're competent and doing a good job and providing services and there's quality contracts and yes, all the things that we need to do to make sure that services are of high quality should be done, but they need to be funded with public money and ongoing public money. And just like open access, there is a sustainability model for diamond open education. It's to fund education as a public good. And I think all of us would agree in this room that education is a public good, but not everybody sees it that way. And so I think there's probably a whole PR campaign that goes along with uh, you know, getting this as a rock solid concept in people's minds. We all know that uh, different states in the United States have withdrawn public support over time for public institutions. Uh, in some states, I have to check my numbers, but I think in Michigan, it's, you know, it's, it's fallen back so far that uh, the University of Michigan public institution uh, has to charge you know, high tuition rates because the public subsidy has been reduced over time. And that's not how you fund public goods. We need to fund education uh, so that everybody can access it and that we can create this public infrastructure of open education to support that. Another opportunity and threat, which I'll talk about in a minute, is, of course, artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm long on AI. I'm excited about AI uh, around OER in particular. I think that um, you know when AI, AI already is at a point and will increasingly be useful to create OER that we don't yet have. Uh, we have o o creating new OER, revising others' OER has always been a very you know, intensive, human intensive process, which takes a lot of resources. Um, what, what might it look like if AI could write really good first drafts for us humans to then revise and remix uh, for OER where we have never built it before? So we've always built, if you think about um, like enrollments, it's kind of a long tail, right? There's our highest enrolled 100 courses that we all teach everywhere. But then what about the course that only a few doctoral students take a year? We've never built OER for those courses. And so what would it look like to build out the entire tale? I think AI may have some answers to us there, at least, at least for first drafts. Um, so you know, what would it look like to have existing OER and new, no, new OER translated 
uh, and to have you know really good translations, um, unlike what sometimes you get out of Google Translate, which aren't bad, but they're not good enough to publish in many cases. Uh, will that get better with AI? I think so. Um, you know, there's already experimentation happening with AI tutors for learners that that are kind of assistants to individual students. There's some interesting research around, you know, will that get us to some of the two sigma learning that we see when learners are attached to human mentors? Probably not, but is it going to be better than what we have now? Probably so. <laughs> Our kids are in uh, public schools and, and in many cases there's high ratios to students to teachers and the teachers certainly can't provide constant one-on-one -on -one mentoring to our two sons uh what would it look like with ai tutors I, I don't know but there's some interesting work happening in this space um i i have some <laughs> diseases that affect me i'm very interested in how uh scientific analysis will be uh positively affected by ai uh, you know, I think it's we've already got some uh, approaching universal translators and new phones that are coming out. I think that's going to be interesting uh, in terms of communicating with people where maybe your language is not their first language and vice versa uh, for science, for education. Uh, as you can tell, we're interested in climate solutions at CC and open. Uh, and there are companies that are in this space championing championing uh, open source AI. Uh, and you'll see a few of them here. There are others. There's also some interesting stuff coming out of policy. So the U.S. Copyright Office has said uh, works that are produced with AI do not get copyright. And they don't say this, but that kind of means that the works are in the public domain. And so as people are creating, say, new OER with AI, um, do we even need to talk about copyright or open licensing? Maybe not. Uh, it might be that they're just automatically in the public domain, which makes them OER and we're good to go. And so lots of interesting, you know, I think there's court cases to come around that. Um, there's uh, community norms for us to put forth, uh, us, I mean, all of us to put forth and talk about around, you know, what's going to happen there. Um, there are also some real AI challenges, which um, come back to this idea of we need publicly funded public infrastructure around open education. We're also going to need it around AI. So, you know, what public infrastructure do we need to ensure that AI assisted knowledge is open, transparent, actual and factual so we know ai will hallucinate and like create fake if you ask ai to write you a research paper it actually creates fake uh citations which is not good and sometimes makes up facts also not good um and so we both want um ai that's accurate but we also need to be able to see inside the black box so that we know how it's computing we know what the training data sets look like we know what the algorithms look like uh, so that we can actually interrogate it because um, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to take a drug that was created by AI that, you know, drug manufacturers and doctors can't actually look into every step of the drug creation process and the design of the drug. Uh, I'm not willing to trust open AI to do that. Um, and so we have to open the hood on this stuff and open is the way to do that. Um, how do we ensure that uh, people can opt out if they want to? Uh, at Creative Commons, where uh, we've been talking a lot about, if you look at our blog, something called signal preferencing. So in addition to putting an open license on your work, uh, we want you to also be able to say, uh, this is my preference that goes with my work. So you might say, I do not want my work scooped up by a training data set and used to train AI. That could be a preference that you make. And then we'll share that metadata with AI companies and, and hope that they honor it. That's a, that's a whole nother talk for another time. <laughs> so I'll skip over that or we'll go down a rabbit hole. Um, how do we ensure that uh, the AI algorithms are known and can be uh, critiqued, improved, analyzed? I just talked about that. Uh, and how do we ensure, and this I think is the biggest threat that we need to keep an eye on, how do we ensure equitable access to AI knowledge analysis and knowledge production for everyone? Already we're seeing kind of free versions of AI and then we're seeing paid versions of AI that are better, faster, more sophisticated, uh, use different custom data sets, at, where if you're wealthy, you get the good stuff. If you're not wealthy, you get the free stuff or the old stuff. Um, that's kind of always the way it's been with a lot of technology. Um, I would posit that AI is likely too important, will reach too deeply into systems of society that we increasingly rely on. Uh, our cars, our transportation, our medical facilities, that it's not sufficient to say, if we can't rely on commercial interests to create this space, we're going to need to 
uh, create public options that we can control and see under the hood. So what should we do now? Uh, well, largely, I think we have a lot of power that we typically don't realize that we have, and we need to use that power. And so here's an example that's uh, happened a lot recently. Um, this is an example where there was an Elsevier. This is a commercial, kind of the biggest commercial journal provider in the world, uh, multi-billion dollar company. Um, and uh, editorial boards are leaving um, the, uh, the journals and going and setting up open source, uh, sorry, open access versions of the journal. And, uh, and in many cases, diamond uh, open access uh, versions of the journal. And they're taking their editorial board, their peer reviewers, and their community with them. And so uh, the commercial entity is kind of left with nothing because all of the value of a journal, all of its credibility, all of its prestige is not the name of the journal. It's, you know, who are, who's the community that publishes there? Um, how good are the peer reviewers? How respected is that journal in the academic space? And so in this case, the entire academic board of NeuroImage, which is this really important journal in neuroscience, uh, that uh, these professors actually just sort of revolted and said, we're gone. We're not going to do your journal anymore because you're creating paywalls. Uh, and they left and they set up their own journal. Um, and so, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about policy, but this is essentially what we do in policy. So we go to the people that have money. These are governments, foundations, and we say, stop giving people money unless you require open. Uh, so once something is, uh, we have an open license requirement in place, uh, then open is just required. So for example, if you take research money from the US government now, there's open requirements. If you take money from the Gates Foundation, they not only have a CC by requirement on, uh, on something that's published, but they require you publish a preprint as well and that you share your data sets. And so we actually go to the funders and we get policies in place. Uh, California, amazing example of this, right? Uh, your governor and legislature stepped forward and said, uh, we need to provide some public money and a lot of public money, $115 million uh, to invest in ZTC degrees, to invest in OER. Uh, California has been a longtime leader in uh, zero textbook cost degrees. Thank you for that. It has spread across the country and around the world. Um, and the, uh, the California community colleges have, and community colleges nationwide have been at the heart of this movement, which has been amazing. And this work goes all the way back to the U.S. Department of Labor TACT grants for those of you that were involved with those, where the U.S. government plunked down $2 billion and said, here's money to go create OER and not just a course or some components, but entire degree programs. Uh, and uh, and uh, Delmar shared this slide with me. Uh, the status, this is, these are probably outdated now because I got this slide a little while ago, um, but here's, you know, kind of a status check of where we are, and you'll hear more tomorrow uh, from the three systems about OER initiatives, and I'm sure this will be discussed as well, but this is an incredible amount of public money, broad distribution across the state of California uh, to directly support uh, with public money the OER and the good work that you're all doing in the California community colleges. Um, Top-down policy, incredibly effective, right? There's also bottom-up policy that we can all engage in, which I call, instead of open policy, I call it open procurement. And so you buy stuff with your local budgets all the time. And so one thing to keep in mind is this build own share. And so when you have to buy something, if you need new content, for example, you're gonna commission or hire somebody to build it, Make sure that you own what you're buying. Make sure in your contract you say that, you know, I, Cal, you know, Cal State Fullerton, hold the copyright to what you, the contractor, are building. Um, and then, you know, I hope that you have internal policies that say, hey, when we own something that we paid for with our public money, uh, we're going to openly license and share what we own. So shorthand, buy what you need? Absolutely. If you can't create it in-house or the OER doesn't already exist, then you probably have to go out and buy something. But let's make sure that we own what we buy and then we share what we own. So um, I hope some of that's interesting. I'm eager to have a discussion, hear from you, see questions. Uh, but I would say, uh, just as a closing thought, 
We've got some big problems, folks. Those SDGs are a long list and they are complex and every country in the world has these problems. California has uh, all of those problems as well. Uh, let's work together, let's be open, let's engage in some of these best practices to solve those big problems. And with that, I thank you. Uh, I, if you wanna uh, get in touch with me, I'm just cable at creativecommons.org. Uh, you can also find me on Mastodon at that uh, tag there. And I'm on uh, Twitter at, at C Green and I'm on other social media as well. So feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk with folks who wanna talk more about this. And with that, I'll turn it back to Delmar. Hmm, great. Thank you very much, Cable. It's always exciting to see what you're doing and what Creative Commons is doing um, and uh, everything out there. So I have a range of questions available. Uh, so for those of you that have questions, please throw them into the chat uh, while I kick things off. So uh, let's start with the bigger picture, the no man is an island approach that uh, you basically were discussing when you were talking about the UN and the UNESCO. Can you give some details about what the UNESCO recommendation is what it provides people um and more importantly what it provides uh the us since now we're getting back into the game absolutely let me share two links in the chat so the first link here will be the actual recommendation so for those of you who haven't seen it let me bring up my chat here so here's the recommendation and then UNESCO also has a open educational resources page um, because they have a bit of a program on OER. And there's the link to that. Um, so if you look at the recommendation, it's broken up in different uh, categories. And so it has, it's got its whole preamble about why open education is important and why OER is important. Um, and then it has kind of the guts of it are, are five areas of action, they call them. So the first one is uh, build capacity of stakeholders to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. So this is raise awareness, uh, you know, provide training, help people uh, understand why this is important. Uh, kind of some of my earlier slides, if you will. Uh, we run a CC certificate program uh, here at Creative Commons. Many of you have probably our graduates of that program. So it's, it's you know, this conference is another awareness raising activity. So it's doing all that stuff to help people understand. Uh, the second category is developing supportive policy. Uh, so this is both the open licensing requirements policy that I discussed, uh, but it's also policy like, uh, you know, changing promotion and tenure policy so that when you, a faculty member, are going from assistant professor to associate professor and you go before your PNT committee, that the production and sharing of OER is viewed as a positive and a plus, and you get points for that rather than a negative. Um, third, uh, encouraging inclusive and equitable quality OER. So really focusing on uh, the design of the content, ensuring that it is inclusive in its language, in, uh, in the language that it's written in, uh, in um, thinking about you know, uh, gender equity, uh, LGBTQ rights, uh, you know, sort of bringing everything we know about uh, e equity into the design of the content because we haven't always done that. Uh, accessibility is another big component here. Fourth, nurturing the creation of sustainability models for OER. This goes right to the heart of what I was talking about. Of essentially, we need public options for a lot of this stuff. We need community owned and operated uh, open education spaces, and we need public money to back those up. And then lastly, facilitating international cooperation, because this is the UN. Um, and uh, so they want countries that are coming up with uh, solutions to this to share those. So for example, my, uh, my 5 a.m. meeting this morning was with the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And that the whole point of that entity is to have governments come together who are in this conversation about sharing openly licensed digital things software, hardware, educational resources, you name it. Um, and some, you know, things like obscure things you'd never think of, like Uganda, Kampala, Uganda has the worst traffic on the planet uh, on any particular day. And so there was some open source software that was written for traffic lights to make the traffic flow better. And they made it open source software and other 
uh, countries around the world said, oh boy, you know, in New York City, we've got bad traffic or in Los Angeles, we have bad traffic or in Bangkok, Thailand, we also have bad traffic. And so maybe we could take that digital public good that's open and licensed and we could use it in our traffic control systems. And so this idea of, hey, when we come up with solutions for open education, let's share those solutions, uh, which is you know, a lot of what you're doing at this conference. And so, um, you know, what can the U.S. do to answer Telmar's question? I think, you know, the first thing we need is uh, like a delegation in the U.S. government that's interagency, that understands this, cares about it, can put money behind it, uh, and then actually start to execute on these five areas. And, and there's a lot of nonprofits, including us at Creative Commons, that are excited to help them do that. Um, and then what we can do locally is you can uh, think about your own institution and, you know, which parts of these uh, areas make sense for California to do at a state level, uh, to make sense for you to do maybe at a community college level or at the UC level or at the Cal State level, uh, or where, where might you cooperate? And so, you know, awareness raising is a great space where you could do it together or providing training. Um, you know, it might be that policy has to be more local. Uh, as opposed to at a higher level. I, I think it's going to depend on the institution and the, the governance framework that you're working in. Uh, but I, I would just start with reading the recommendation and, uh, and just ask, kind of keep in mind, what can I do that's within my power? What can I do at my institution where I have to get other involve, others involved? What can I do at a system level where maybe I have to have a system conversation about this? Great, thank you. <laughs> There's a question in the chat. Uh, uh, how would you like to see AI and OER come together if you can assume all risks are reduced? Uh, uh, in other words, what is your dream for AI and OER? If I could take all the risks out of it, which is hard, but uh, my dream would be um, that all of those things that I threw up on the screen actually work. You know, I'd love to be able to you know, say to an AI, uh, build me, uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Build me a new calculus textbook in Kiswahili language that you know has the following chapters and you know give a very descriptive thing like what we've all played with with OpenAI to write essays for us or whatnot, and have it kick out something that's really quite good that yes might need some editing but is ninety nine percent of the way there. To me, that's very exciting. Um, I'd love to see. Uh, and like uh, entities like learning equality are already starting to work in this space, but I'd love to see standards alignment around OER. So I'd love to be able to see somebody in Germany that has a math standard that has a particular code say, boy, I can't find OER uh, and have their AI go out and search the world and look at all the standards and all the OER that's aligned to those standards. And if those standards are not aligned to the OER to have the AI take a swing at doing that and then have somebody in one country who just is interested in their standard uh, you know, in their state or province or country, be able to get OER from a different country that's in a different language and have it translated well and have its standards aligned when it comes into so that use and reuse is just amplified. Um, I'd love to see um, us, you know, get AI good at translation so that when we create an OER, it's available in thousands of languages and not just one. Or, you know, right now, like the best we can usually do is three or four if we're doing a really good job. The, the United Nations tends to do seven, but they spend millions of dollars uh, doing that. You know, how can we bring those costs down to near zero? Uh, I love the idea of uh, intelligent tutors that kind of stay with us, <laughs> that, that uh, are taking cues from our, you know, our educators. Uh, and the educators can create frameworks within which they hope that learners kind of stay, some guardrails, uh, but that uh, there's enough freedom for learners to experiment and, and learn in a learning pathway and be supported by an AI tutor along that space. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the Socratic method, but frankly, we don't have enough human power. Or we are, let's, let's put it this way. We don't have enough public investment and enough educators to provide the Socratic method for all learners. And so that's a huge gap and I'm curious to see what we can do with AI. Great, thank you. Another question, is Creative Commons engaging in the conversation around indigenous cultural and uh, intellectual property? And if so, how? Yeah, we, we are always. Um, and oftentimes the answer is 
uh, it is not appropriate to openly license uh, something because it shouldn't be shared. And even backing up a step from that, in many cases, indigenous culture and indigenous knowledge is they don't, uh, in many, many peoples do not recognize copyright or other kind of colonial based intellectual property law in the first place. And if something is not copyrighted, then to openly license it with an open copyright license doesn't make any sense. And so we work with other uh, organizations that do work in this space. Uh, TK Labels, maybe somebody could drop in the link for, uh, for TK Labels. Um, uh, they work in this space. They actually work directly with uh, many indigenous uh, peoples around the world to say, you know, they just ask questions. How do you think about knowledge? How is knowledge shared? With whom can it be shared? Uh, under what circumstances? So, for example, I live in Washington State. We have many different indigenous uh, peoples here uh, who have different rules. And in some, uh, in some cases, uh, only women are allowed because it's a very matriarchal uh, society. Only women are allowed to access certain knowledge and men and even in their own uh, their own peoples are not allowed to view knowledge. In some cases, it's age based before you can view knowledge. In some cases, it's, um, you know, are you in the bloodline? In some cases, not traditional knowledge, um, they want to share it, but only under certain circumstances. So for example, thanks, uh, Ash, for sharing the link. In many cases, um, well, let me just state this bluntly, for decades, uh, those of us in the global north have gone to the global south, especially in the Amazon rainforest, to use a, a big example, and we've taken plants and we've created drugs out of those plants and we sell them out of big pharma and the prices that we charge are not accessible to the people whose plants we took in the first place. And so it's completely extractive. Uh, and then we put up paywalls that don't let the indigenous peoples who have the knowledge and shared the knowledge. And we even went onto their land and took physical objects out of their land to build wealth and build new products and value that are then not shared back. And so the United Nations for years has been running and I'm, run, I'm drawing a blank on the program, but there's a whole uh, biodiversity, uh, I forget what it's called. Um, I'd have to look it up, but uh, where there are new uh, economic systems being created to give back, uh, but which is only part of it, but there's most important, there's sort of new uh, norms about even going in in the first place. So not assuming that you can just go into the Amazon and do research without permission of indigenous peoples that already live there, like to actually engage and discuss. And as I, I, I mostly sit and listen in a lot of these conversations, but what I learn over and over and over is that mostly people want to be asked, they want to be at the table, they want to be in the discussion. Sometimes and oftentimes the answer is no, um, you can't use this knowledge or you can't use it without our express permission. But oftentimes the answer is yes, but, like yes, but we want to be acknowledged in this way. Or yes, but you can only use it if you are a woman. Or yes, but you can, uh, we don't want this information published in a commercial space. Or yes, but any benefits that come out of it must accrue back to us. And so you have to sign this side agreement that says that you will report back to us and you will come back to us physically and tell us what you learned so that our people can benefit from whatever you figured out. Um, and so it's a very complex space. You know, it's, it's interesting for us to work in because kind of the whole point of CC licenses is, is reduce friction, make it simple, reduce transaction costs. And, and when you work in indigenous spaces, oftentimes the transaction costs are very high, uh, but they are necessarily and appropriately high because it is not a transaction. It's not an economic transaction. It's not an extractive, it's not a quick reuse transaction. It's a discussion. It's, a, it's an agreement that you're, that you're making and having in ways that are dictated by the people that own the knowledge. It's probably more of an answer than you wanted. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Cable. Now, here's the next question. When faculty reach out to librarians for OER textbooks options, where they uh, where do you recommend searching for these uh, items or referring them to? Program examples uh, include uh, trades, electricians, solar, uh, engineering, welding, et cetera, uh, workforce-related topics. 
Yeah, great question. So um, I, I think it happens at at multiple levels. So it happens at the individual level and the kind of the awareness raising and training. A lot of people learn, oh, I can go to LibreTex or I can go to OER Commons or I can go to OpenStax. They start to learn where some of the stuff is. Um, and that's helpful on, on discovery. Um, they uh, oftentimes people will go to librarians because let's face it, librarians are awesome and they know how to find stuff. And especially research librarians are like, blow your mind, incredible at this. And um, librarians have a long history of creating uh, what are called lib guides, or sometimes they call them other guides. But you know, lib guides are oftentimes you see them around OER. So here is a library guide for chemistry OER. And it says, you know, like, we're not going to talk about all the other universe of OER. We're just going to talk about where's the best chemistry stuff. And so, you know, here's where the best top 10 chemistry textbooks are that are most used. Here's where the best repositories are in the world or, or referatories that really focus in on chemistry. And you don't have to look through all of it. Here's the direct link to where you can find chemistry in LibreTex or, or wherever. Um, and so librarians are tremendously helpful there. Librarians are also great at... Um, you needing a particular piece of OER and like they are amazing at going out and finding it in many cases. Uh, we should all keep in mind that sometimes we can't find the OER that's perfect for our needs, but sometimes there's something close and we should exercise that open license and modify it into what we do need. So when I used to work with the uh, community colleges in Washington State, we had this program called the Open Course Library, which we were trying to build the entire Associates of Science degree as OER. And our, our physics team went to MIT OpenCourseWare and they downloaded all of MIT physics courses. And they said, this is amazing, but it's not amazing for new community college students who are learning physics for the first time. It's amazing for MIT students. And so there's a lot of revision work that needs to be done, but they were able to do that because it had an open license on it. Um, and then last, I would say, you know, there's, um, we, we can raise awareness through events like this, right? So, and, you know, LibreTex, I know, and others have webinars on a regular basis and Merlot does and, uh, and the different systems have awareness raising events where they talk about how you find things. Uh, I would also say join listserv. So, you know, CCC OER is the, uh, the Community College Consortia for OER started in California. Um, people ask questions on that list or the Spark OER list and say, hey, I can't find OER for X. Does anybody know? And it's incredible. Within like 15, 20 minutes, people say, oh, yeah, I have that, or I know where that is. Uh, Open Oregon also runs an amazing list. All these lists are free to join. Uh, and you can ask questions of your peers. And, and then you can go back and search the archives of these lists. So there's lots of different ways uh, to find OER. I would also say this is my hope is AI will help us in this and help us build some better meta searches uh, than we have. Um, there are some pretty good ones. Uh, Georgia has a meta search. Um, so anyway, those are a few discovery ideas. Yeah, definitely. I mean, AI comes in where many of these, actually let me phrase, almost all of these things are very, uh, very much at the top level. Like here is a textbook dealing with chemistry, not here is a page dealing with Nernst equation, da, 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 da. And you need something a lot more sophisticated and comprehensive in order to address it. Uh, the next question that comes up is, are there any partnerships between Khan Academy, for example, Khan Mango, Creative Commons, UNESCO, uh, addressing the uh, the UN Sustainability Development Goals on Education? So uh, Khan Academy videos, last time I checked, are licensed, I think, CC by NCSA. Um, I have to go look at that. I haven't looked for a while. Um, and then Khan Academy also has Khan Mingo, which is... Uh, one of the uh, uh, AI tutors that we were talking about earlier, um, which is very interesting. If you haven't watched Sal give some of his talks about Conmingo, they're quite persuasive, as Sal can be, um, and I think worth following. Uh, so what's the connection between CC and the UN and, and uh, Khan Academy? We don't have any direct connection with Khan Academy other than they use our licenses on a bunch of their content and videos. Um, uh, so we don't have any partnership with Khan Academy or anything like that. Um, I have been in various UN agency meetings where Khan Academy is talked about and used, but uh, maybe somebody knows something I don't. I, I don't know if there's a big partnership going on. If there is, I'd love to know about it. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Okay, so let me get to this question about AI uh, and the implications of interpreting the results of AI as being in the public domain, which is controversial to many people in the community, as you no doubt know. Uh, I have not done an analysis, uh, although uh, I'm concerned about this, uh, for the output of AI, how much, if it's just dealing with text, how much of the text that uh, comes out um, can be directly tracked to a specific source that is copyrighted. Now, so if you try to use a fair use argument, which is oftentimes ill-defined in terms of how many words or how many paragraphs or things like that, that you're allowed to copy it constructively. I don't, I, I feel very uncomfortable about AI spitting something that's that has one or multiple sentences that are clearly copied from something that's copyrighted and uh, and then basically declaring this is now open source irrespective of anything. Um, do you think that that's actually going to be persistent? Do you feel that the court cases uh, may consider AI to be too big to fail uh, and wouldn't address that? What's the general uh, thoughts uh, in your uh, sphere of the world uh, regarding this? Yeah, we share all those same concerns. Um, I think, so I shared what the US Copyright Office said. I think that was a positive step forward, but I think it's overly simplistic. So um, for all the reasons you stated, for example, there is a court case where, I forget who it was, but somebody went to OpenAI. Oh, I know who it was. It was the, um, I don't know if it was the producer or the writer or the director, somebody that was involved with was it Game of Thrones or, or maybe it was The Hobbit. I can't remember, but they basically went to one of these AI things and said, they put a prompt in that said, write me a prequel to, I'm not sure if it was Game of Thrones, but I'm going to use that as the example. Write me a prequel script, movie script to the Game of Thrones uh, and I want the prequel to include these types of things and more dragons and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it did. And it was really good. And it was clear that when you, and then somebody shared it. And, and then people read it and they were like, wow, that's really good. And the people that actually created the copyright holders of Game of Thrones, again, I don't know if that's the example here, but we'll stick with it, said, hey, wait a minute, there's no way that this AI could have produced that script without having a full copy and actually reading and, uh, and analyzing and then creating a derivative work of the Game of Thrones series and book. There's no way it could have done that derivative without relying directly on this clear copyright work or multiple copyrighted works. And it's a pretty persuasive argument. Right. What the AI companies come back with is they say, look, we don't we're not making or using copies. We're we're bringing in data and we're tokenizing the data. And then we're looking at the the near relationships between the data so that we can predict what the next word is going to be. And that is fundamentally a new copyrighted work. It is not a copy. It's not a derivative. It's a completely new creative act. And therefore, it doesn't, we don't have to rely on copyright because we're making a fair use in what we're doing, technically what we're doing. This is all gonna go to court, right? A lot of this is in court. I don't know how this is gonna come out. I get scared when these court cases go in um, because the judges in these court cases and certainly the juries are not sophisticated in copyright law. Copyright law itself is extremely outdated to deal with AI and uh, politicians that make the law and would update copyright law are also relatively unsophisticated in both copyright in openness and in the technology of AI. And so, you know, there's, I mentioned I was in this digital public goods meeting earlier, we were talking about AI and the rush in by some in the open source software community to try to get AI commercial companies to make small open adjustments to the AI. And there are others that are saying, no, that's not enough. We need like the diamond open access version of AI. We need a public infrastructure version of AI um, so that we can see under the hood so that we can make decisions about what data goes in and what doesn't. Um, and so I worry that the law is out of date. I worry that the policymakers are out of date. 
Um, I worry that the commercial, the amount of money that's going into the commercial AI providers is in the tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars in some cases, and that there has been zero so far I, uh, discussions at a high level of public money going in to create public infrastructure of AI. And so I'm worried about all this. Um, and of course, the politicians have the added concern about falling behind. And so everybody's in a rush, right? The US is in a rush because they're worried about China beating them to AI. And so how do you go fast? You just throw your support behind your commercial companies that have billions of dollars that can move quickly. And on the side, they're having discussions about ethics and data privacy, but not at the speed they're having the other conversations. Uh, at Creative Commons, we're talking about preference signaling, which I talked about before. I think that's a good step forward. We're excited about it. We think it's a good thing. Um, I'm mostly excited about preference signals to, yes, signal about what we want, have done with our OER and other open things in AI. But if I'm totally honest, they folks, they've already scraped it all. <laughs> The AI companies have already grabbed all the OER, they've grabbed all the open access, and they don't even care about license. They've grabbed all the copyrighted stuff as well. So don't think they haven't also scraped every commercial uh, for-profit journal article. They just have. And they're, and they're relying on fair use and fair dealing arguments in court, and probably they'll win. And so um, you know, we're getting a lot of blowback at Creative Commons right now from people all around the world saying, hey, I'm not going to use open license anymore. I'm out of OER, I'm out of open access, or I'm out of open science because openness is the doorway for AI to take all my stuff. And we're having to educate people to say, uh, we're sorry to tell you, but they already took it. And, and B, the copyright's not stopping them anyway because they're using limitations and exceptions to copyright. And when they're using limitations and exceptions to copyright, which we all want to be there for, you know, fair use is good for us too. Um, and we want the Marrakesh Declaration out there so that people who have various uh, challenges and disabilities can access copyrighted works. Like we don't want to do away with these limitations and exceptions, but they're leveraging those laws and policies to their benefit. So open license or not open license isn't going to stop them. And so try to come back to first principles, like why do you share OER in the first place? Why are you why are you publishing an open access? Those things still matter. And you shouldn't, we hope, we're not gonna tell people what to do. We hope that you don't change your sharing behavior and the contributions you're making to the commons because you're worried about AI. AI is gonna do what it's do. If you wanna direct your energy, Let's try to get preference signaling done. And yes, put your preferences in and we'll get that data to the AI companies and hope they honor them. But let's also help them do better in attribution. Let's help them do better in funneling money back to the commons based activities like, you know, LibreText. If they're if they're scouring LibreText, they should be giving some money back so that that public resource can be sustained over time. You know, let's let's engage in conversations with them that are actually going to help what we're all trying to accomplish. And so it's this weird, complex space um, where politicians are behind, the law's behind, the money's behind, we're behind, everybody's freaking out because of speed, and there aren't what I would call a lot of sort of the more progressive, sensible conversations happening about what we should be talking about because we're all a little freaked out because it's so new. So you mentioned preference signaling. Uh, many of us may not be familiar with that term. Do you think you can define it? Yeah, so it's sort of what it says. Um, I have a preference with my piece of OER. Um, my preference might be that I'm looking for help translating translating into Spanish. And it's additional information that's now going to travel with my openly licensed work. My preference might also might be um, I don't want this to be scooped up in an, in an AI training data set. And that's now data that is part of my, my openly licensed thing that I shared. And then that we will expose that data to AI providers to say, hey, don't scrape this. The, the user doesn't want it. My preference might be, um, this is what I want. Uh, this is how I want to receive attribution. So yes, we're building preference signals, or we will build preference signals at CC, mainly because people are want to send signals to AI providers. That's kind of the impetus for it. Uh, but I'm more interested and more excited about preference signals for us to collaborate better than we collaborate today. Because people don't share because they want to be greedy or stingy 
or like try to make a bunch of money. People share because we want to share. We want you to use the work. We want you to translate the work. I want you to improve my work. I want you to contact me if you think there's a partnership where we could enhance the work or create version two. Like that's what I want. And so I want to be able to put that in a preference signal and say, hey, and, and I, maybe I have 17 preference signals that go with my open license work. Don't scrape me and put me in a training data set. I want to translate this into finish and I'm looking for a partner to create the next version. And so I, it's a kind of an interesting space CC hasn't been in in the past that provides a new layer of information about what we want to have happen with our openly licensed thing. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm pushing you hard with these questions. I have one final question and then I'll uh, end this session. Uh, and that's uh, largely around uh, what many of us call open washing uh, and the, the effort of organizations that are uh, not aligned with open uh, policies uh, to brand themselves as open uh, in one way or another. And, and things get confusing uh, when you start using terms like uh, open access versus OER uh, uh, and all the things that's connected to that. And you you emphasize the difference between open, not equal to free. Uh, this is somewhat of a bigger picture here, but uh, several years ago, there was a uh, conflict in terms of the UNESCO definition uh, uh, with the Hewlett definition of OER commonly used in the States in terms of whether things should be free or not. Do you think you can comment on a Creative Commons stance regarding free, um, the equivalency of free with open within this general perspective of uh, individuals trying to, I think, misuse the word open in various ways? Sure. I I'm happy to tell you what Creative Commons view is on this. And we're very aligned with UNESCO. Um, when I say free access, what I mean is at least one version of the work is freely available. So that tends to be a digital version of the work. And the reason that we can make digital versions of an openly licensed thing free is that the costs of storage and transmission of a digital file is incredibly low. Yes, there's still a cost, but it's near zero. And so that's what I mean by free. Uh, can you charge for a printed copy? Sure, like there are much higher costs when you print out a 300 page textbook. That's why OpenStax charges, whatever they charge, 35 bucks for, for a printed copy of a book. Uh, colleges and universities take open textbooks, they go to their bookstore, the bookstore prints them, sells them at cost. It, should we be doing that? Absolutely, that's a service to students and students should pay for that book. If the students don't have money to pay for that book, though, they could go and get the free digital version of it and hopefully an editable digital version so you can exercise a license as you need to. And that digital version, well, frankly, any version is, is uh, perpetual, right? If it's open in a license, you get to keep it forever. The physical copy of the book and the digital copy. And so when I say free, to, when I get specific about that, I mean at least one version of the of the OER needs to be free that I can, I as a user can get a copy of it and keep it forever. And so uh, when, when it comes down to OER, uh, we have always, and, and I have always stood firm on two aspects of any OER definition. One is you've got to have free access, no cost access to at least a digital version of the thing. And second, you must have the legal rights to be able to adapt the work. So I've got, that's why our ND licenses do not work for OER. They, they don't allow for adaptations to be created and shared publicly, which is antithetical in my view, in our view, to what OER should be about. Great. Thank you for all the interesting discourse here. Um, with that, um, I'd like to close out this uh, introductory keynote session. Um, Thank you again, Larry, um, sorry, Cable. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to do a reaction here in order to be able to express it. So with that, uh, I will again close this thing out. Uh, we have another 20 
seven minutes uh, before the start of the uh, the next uh, breakout rooms. So I encourage people to take a break, uh, ruminate over everything that Cable mentioned, um, and then come back uh, to following the session. Thank you, everyone. And Thanks, thank you. everybody.